welcome to section 4.5 from your Calc 1 course. It's a lonely Friday afternoon, so we brought in a corporate sponsor. Today's sponsor is WMTH, the station that rocks the docks and reaches the beaches. So live from Royal Oak, it's section 4.5. Hope you're having a good Friday. Let's take a look at some things to consider when you're graphing a function, now that we know a little bit more about calculus. So the first thing to always consider when you're graphing a function is the domain. Always, always, always need to know where this function lives. So what values of x can I put in here? And what values can't I put in there? Another nice thing to notice about your functions is whether or not they're symmetric. So are they even functions? Do they have even symmetry? Are they parallel? It's going to be symmetric with respect to the y-axis. So that's a good thing to look for. Examples of even functions would be, for instance, the cosine. There's odd functions as well, odd symmetry. It's harder to see, but you will see it with things like uh, the tangent function. For rational functions, these are functions that are really a polynomial divided by another polynomial. A lot of times you can pick up some asymptotes from those. So you can find a, a horizontal asymptote and there's three different versions of that horizontal asymptote. It's going to depend on the degree of the numerator and the degree of the denominator. If the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, then eventually the graph is going to head towards y equals 0 as a horizontal asymptote. If the degree of the numerator equals the degree of the denominator, then the asymptote is going to be the ratio of the leading coefficients. So we should see an example like that as one of the examples we'll cover today. And then something that I'm not going to get a chance to cover today, but I'll assign a problem in homework number 61, is an oblique asymptote, or sometimes called a slant asymptote. And that's going to happen if the degree of the numerator is one more than the degree of the denominator. And then you're going to get the quotient of these two, whatever that is, uh, not looking at the remainder, but the quotient is going to be the equation of your oblique asymptote. Another thing to look for in addition to your horizontal and vertical asymptotes would be, or your horizontal asymptotes, I should say, would be your vertical asymptotes. Where does the graph have a vertical asymptote? And that's generally going to be at roots of the denominator. So look out for those. Intercepts, yeah, great points to plot. Set x equal to 0 to find the y-intercept and set y equals 0 to find the x-intercept. Let's not forget the calculus. So all these things are things that you can do without calculus. But down here, critical points. You should look for where the graph has critical points. That is, places where the derivative is 0 or does not exist. Those are your critical points. One important thing, make sure that these are points in the domain. If you find a critical point in are outside the domain, it's just not a critical point. Intervals where the function is increasing and decreasing. This also leads to the first derivative test. So if a function goes from positive to negative with respect to its derivative, then you've gone from increasing to decreasing, that point's a maximum. So uh, likewise, the second derivative talks about the shape of a function, concave up and concave down. Look for those and kind of put all these things together in a logical way along with looking at the graph. There's nothing wrong to look at your graphing calculator or to look at decimals and see what you can see that way. So with that, let's go through and start doing some problems. It's going to start with a nice little warm-up toss, problem number four. And that's going to be like this. Y equals x to the fourth minus 8x squared, plus 2, no, plus 8, plus 8, there we go. Well, the nice thing about polynomial functions is that the domain is all real numbers. So you could write negative infinity to infinity. Uh, I personally like script R. Sometimes I'll give a, an occasional point of extra credit for that. That's more like in an algebra class, but... In any case, it's all real numbers for the domain for any polynomial. That also means its derivative is another polynomial, which also has, as its domain, all real numbers. 
But let's look at the derivative, because the derivative is going to start telling us a lot about our function. So y prime is going to be 4x cubed minus 16x, and hey, that's it, right? y double prime is going to be 12x squared minus 16. Now, with respect to both of these, I'd like to know where they're each zero, and then I can determine where they're going to change signs. So let's factor this. I can factor out a 4x. That's going to leave behind uh, x squared minus 4. Over here, I can factor out a 4 again. So let's factor out the 4 there. You know what? Actually, we're going to take a different tact here. I'm just going to write that equal to 0. This one factors a little bit more. So 4x times x minus 2 times x plus 2. Instead of factoring this one, I'm going to move the 16 to the other side and get 16 equals 12x squared, or 16 over 12 equals x squared. Let's put that in lowest terms first. A 4 will go into each of those things, so it's going to be 4 thirds equals x squared, plus or minus the square root on both sides, so plus or minus 2 over the square root of 3 equals x. So that's where the second derivative is 0. And it's also on either side of these points where the second derivative can change signs. Here, the first derivative equals 0 when, well, let's just read it off from here. Because we've got something times something times something equals 0. One of these somethings has to be 0. So 4x equals 0 when x equals 0. x minus 2 equals 0 when x equals 2 or x equals negative 2. Let's make a little chart now to try and understand this function and make sense of the graph when we see it. So, there we go, x, f, f prime, negative 2, 0, and 2. So we'll start here, and there, now we know that the derivative is 0 at all these points. You can use your graphing calculator to figure out what the value of the function is at those points. Let me put that into my calculator. And let's see. Let's put in the derivative first. So clear out all the stuff that's here. Let's put in the derivative. You don't have to put it in its factored form. It's good enough to put it in the regular form. 4x cubed minus 16x. And I go to my table, second table. I need to test points on either side of negative 2, on either side of 0 and 2. So let's pick, say, negative 3, negative 1, 1, and uh, 3. The important thing that you should get here is not the actual numbers, it's the signs involved. It goes negative, positive, negative, positive. And that's what we're looking for. So let's write down those signs and see what that tells us about our function. Negative, positive, negative, positive. Well, here, let's see. The first derivative asks, uh, will tell you what about a function. Anyone? Let me see. Um, Jeff. Hey, how about Jeff? All right. What's the first derivative tell us about a function? Well, I'm glad you asked, because the first derivative tells us where a function is increasing or decreasing. So here it's decreasing, here it's increasing, decreasing, and then increasing. So we expect that of our function. This is going to be either a global min or a local min. Let's just put min here. This is going to be a global min or uh, a local max, excuse me, global max or a local max, because the function is increasing then decreasing, and finally another min. Before we actually look at the graph, let's see if we can't 
figure out something about the second derivative. So for the second derivative, we had these as some points of possible inflection. Inflection points are where the second derivative can change sign. So let's look at those. I'm not going to be worried so much about you rationalizing the, the denominator here. Let's just put in our couple points, negative 2 over the square root of 3 and 2 over the square root of 3. So here and here. Now just like our work with uh, the previous one, we got to test some points here to find out what's going on with the second derivative. And as far as the second derivative is concerned, you could plug this equation into your calculator and do the testing of points. So plug that in. I think we can kind of predict what's going to happen here because this is just a, a parabola. So if you don't mind, I'm going to skip that and just look at the results here. Positive, negative, positive. So what's that say about our function? What's happening there? Well, where the second derivative is positive, you're going to have a concave up shape, then a concave down shape, and then a concave up shape. So, yay. Nice. Let's see if we can't put that all together along with the graph. And, you know, one point that you might want to add to all your work here is the y-intercept. So where's the y-intercept? Well, you're going to set x equal to 0. And that's pretty easy to do. y equals 0 to the fourth minus 8 times 0 squared plus 8. Now, I don't think I need my graphic calculator for that one. That's just 8. Now, it might not be a bad idea to get approximate values for some of these other ones. Actually, I'm sure we can get exact values at, at these, but here, maybe some decimal values. So let's put in the actual function itself and get some decimal values here. So I'll just cursor over here, press Enter to toggle the uh, equal sign here, and that shuts off the graph. I don't want to see the graph. I don't want it in my tables. The original function was x to the fourth minus 8x squared plus 8. So let's go to our table and find some values. Just, let's delete those. Negative 2 and 2. So that adds a couple points to our, our graph here at negative 8 and 8. Of course, we know this one is positive 8. So those points should be on our graph. But let's do these as well. So negative 2 divided by the square root of 3. So we get about 1.15, called 1.16. So negative 1.16. And, oh, excuse me. I should be using the y value. So the y value is negative 0.89. Now, likewise, over here, with uh, the positive root, 2 divided by square root of 3. I'm just going to get a symmetric point. So about, this would be about 1.16. And again, about positive, or no, no, negative 0.989. So that's a negative there. Okay, so nice. Let's see if we can't put all those things together and form a graph. So those last five points have already been plotted for you, but let's make sure that our graph makes sense and matches the information that we're given. One thing that seeing points like negative 2 and negative 8, positive 2 and positive 8 kind of suggest is that this is an even function. And if you look back at this, the fancy way to test if something is an even function is if f of x 
equals f of negative x. Then it's an even function. So if I put in a negative x here, negative x to the fourth power is just going to be x to the fourth power. And likewise here, so those things would be an even function. Okay. Well, I know where my function is decreasing. It's decreasing until it gets to this point. So it's going to look something like this. Decrease until it gets to that point. And then it starts increasing. And it's going to increase all the way till zero. But along the way, something interesting is going to happen. It's going to change shape from concave up to concave down. And I've probably exaggerated the effect here, but I'm not really trying to be that accurate. Uh, I'm just trying to get in the critical parts here. So concave down until we get to this point, then concave up, and then up the rest of the way. So let me get rid of this as fast as I can because it looks horrible and take a look at the graph on Desmos and see how we did. So there's our critical points and there's our graph. So it would be tough to spot exactly where this inflection point is, that is where it changes from concave up to concave down without the calculus. So, okay. Hopefully we're doing all right with that first one, problem number four. Let's keep going with problem number 10. And you know, I'm getting a little hungry here. So if you don't mind, I'm going to take time out for a snack. But uh, just to let you know, let the viewer know, oops, wrong one, that it's a healthy snack. I'm going to have some grapes. So appreciate your concern for my health, though. Thank you. Okay. Back to problem number 10 here. Problem number 10, I've done some of the work for you, and let's take advantage of that. So here's our function, problem number 10, but let's look at it carefully before we start getting too excited with the graph. And that's going to be problem number 10. Y equals x squared plus 5x over 25 minus x squared. And there's a, there's a couple things I guess I would suggest that you take note of. Let's first of all work with the domain. If you notice, the denominator uh, is going to have some issues. And maybe what I'll do is I'll do this. I'll take out the negative this way. So the negative of x squared minus 25. If you distribute this, you can still see it's the same. Negative x squared, negative times the negative is positive. I'm just rewriting it because it's easier to factor this way. In the numerator, things are still the same. I'm going to put that negative out in front now. And this factors as x minus 5 times x plus 5. And in the numerator, x squared plus 5x. So right now we're trying to determine the domain. So can anyone help me determine the domain? Um, Jeff. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. You're doing pretty good today. Right, exactly. So you can't have x equal 5 or negative 5 because it just doesn't work here for us. You'd be dividing by 0. We know that's a mathematical no-no. So our domain is the set of x such that x is not equal to 5 and x is not equal to negative 5. Now that's probably a little bit fancier than maybe we need. At the very least, what you need to realize is this part right here. x can't be 5 or negative 5. So, all right. Let's see what else we can do before we do any calculus at all. Before we do any calculus at all, let me go back to, say, this right here. Uh, 
So a different form of this, x squared plus 5x over negative x squared plus 25. So I guess a nice way to go from here to here would be first to just change the order, then to take out the negative factor. But what I want to draw your attention to is right here. This is a rational polynomial. Now the leading coefficients here tell us a lot about what's going to happen with this thing. Now it's not written, but it's understood that there's a 1 up here, so a 1 here, and a negative 1 here. Because these two polynomials in the numerator and denominator have the same degree, that tells us something about the horizontal asymptote. The horizontal asymptote is just going to be a ratio of those two. So that's case B on your handout. So our horizontal asymptote is y equals 1 over negative 1. How about, better yet, just y equals negative 1. Okay, let's keep that around. Let's work with the vertical asymptotes. So we'll go back to this form of our function here and take a look. So I'll have x times x plus 5 over, and that negative still out front, x minus 5 times x plus 5. So at 5, you're going to have a vertical asymptote. There's just no getting around it. That's going to be big problems. But because these terms kind of want to cancel here, well, the function is still not defined at negative 5, but you're not going to get a vertical asymptote. What you're going to get is a hole in the graph. And it would be a nice problem to work with in terms of limits is to figure out the location of that hole, but there's going to be a hole there. So we've got the domain, we've got the horizontal asymptotes, and we've got the vertical asymptote. So, wow. A lot of information that we got, and we still haven't done any calculus. Now, as far as the calculus is concerned, at least some of that's done for us. All right? So I relieve you of the burden of finding the first and second derivatives. So the first derivative is 5 over x minus 5 squared. And the second derivative is y double prime is negative 10 over x minus 5 cubed. Well, in examining this, at least uh, the first derivative, we need to look at where this can change signs. And even though the denominator has this squared term, the denominator can change signs. I, mean, I guess it could change signs. You have to look at places on either side of 5. 5 is going to be a vertical asymptote. We know that it uh, can change around that vertical asymptote. So at x equals 5, well, at x equals 5, the function does not exist. So here's a little fancy math symbol does not exist. Let's cross that out. And of course, if it doesn't exist for the function, it's not going to exist in the domain. That's okay. What we want to do is we want to test the derivative on either side of that function. So I'm not going to take the time to plug it into my graphing calculator because I think I can see what's going to happen. Let's pick something to the right of 5, like 6. 6 minus 5 is 1. 1 squared is... One. Basically, I get a positive divided by a positive. That's going to be positive. What if I chose something to the left, like 0? Well, 0 minus 5 is negative 5, but when I square it, I get something positive. And again, I have the quotient of something positive over something positive. So oddly enough, this function 
always, always, always has to be increasing. So that's kind of interesting. It should be an interesting graph. Last but not least, let's take a look at the second derivative. Second derivative, kind of like the first derivative, can change signs only at x equal 5. So we'll draw ourselves a little table again, f, f double prime, 5. Now it's not going to exist at either point, so we'll throw those out. But we can still test on either side to see what happens with the function. Now all I need to do is see what happens to the second derivative to the right of 5 and to the left of 5. So let's pick a number to the right like 6. The denominator is going to be positive, because 6 minus 5 is 1 cubed is still positive. A negative divided by a positive, yes, is negative. How about to the left, if I pick 0? Well, I get 0 minus 5 cubed is going to be something negative. A negative divided by a negative is positive. So the function is concave up and concave down. Wow. Okay. Let's start putting all these pieces together. We know that we've got vertical asymptote here. And a horizontal asymptote here. So what else do we know? We know that the function is always increasing, and yet somehow it's going to be concave up and concave down. Let's take a look at our graph from Desmos and see if we can start making sense of all these things. So here's your asymptotes, vertical asymptote, horizontal asymptote, and this point here. Or excuse me, there's our graph. Our graph is in blue. And no, oh, it matches everything we expected, right? It's concave up here, concave down here, increasing here, increasing to the right of 5 as well. Now, I'll leave it for you to uh, tinker around with, but you might be able to figure out that at this point, negative 5 and negative 0.5, that the function has a hole in the graph. And when you draw your graph, it should have that hole at 0, excuse me, at uh, five, negative 5 and negative 0.5. So. Cool. How are we looking on that one? Doing all right? Let's see if we can graph that one. So. I'll start by putting my, my little hole at negative 5 and negative 0.5, and then just draw a nice graph heading up and up towards our vertical asymptote, and then settling down towards our horizontal asymptote. This should probably be a little bit more clear with these things. It's not showing up too good on the video here yet. So here's our vertical asymptote, and here's our horizontal asymptote. the other side of things. Now, generally speaking, a lot of functions don't cross their asymptote, but they can. In our case, it's not going to, but uh, you can see a graph cross the asymptote, you know, closer towards the origin, the x and y axes, but in this case, it doesn't. So, okay, let's finish off our graph and see how we're looking. Something like that. Okay. Uh, this one looks better. Any questions? Any questions? Um, you know, it is a Friday, and I've given up my Friday here to, to do this, so can someone do me a favor? Someone toss me a cold one? Ah, thank you. Appreciate it. All right.
let's move on now to problem number 30. So, problem number 30 looks like this. Y equals x to the 5 thirds minus 5 times x to the 2 thirds. Let's play around with that and see what we can come up with. There's also a little bit of a tricky factorization that I want you to pick up on. I've done it in different ways, but I've got another way that, that might help you out in terms of being able to factor this. So, let's see. Y equals x to the 5 thirds minus 5x to the 2 thirds. Okay, well, as far as the domain is concerned, since I'm dealing with an odd root, if you wanted to rewrite this as the cube root of x to the fifth minus 5 times the cube root of x squared, I'm not going to have any problems with an undefined uh, expression because of the radical. You can take an odd root of any number, even excuse me, positive or negative. So the domain is everything. Domain is negative infinity to infinity. Now I'll try and be good about looking at the domain because later on in this course, when we're working with that, we're going to need to um, look at the domain first when we're doing our optimization problems because you don't want to find a minimum or maximum for something that's outside the domain. And well, that's about it. It's not a rational polynomial, so I'm not going to get any vertical or horizontal asymptotes. Uh, so let's work with some derivatives then. And as far as the first derivative is concerned, y prime would be 5 thirds x to the 2 thirds minus, well, let's see, it's going to be 10 thirds x to the negative 1 third. Okay, now when you're working with these things, in order to find out where something has um, its critical points, you're going to need to be able to factor this. And the problem that we have is that I want to factor out this term. And so I'm going to try and make it a little bit more user friendly for you. So let's write this. Uh, a slightly different way. If you notice, what's the difference between two-thirds and negative one-third? It's a jump of one. And that's kind of a key here. It's going to motivate what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to rewrite this as five-thirds uh, x to the first power times x to the negative one-third. Now that may look a little strange, but take a look what's going on here. If you added the exponents, 1 minus 1 third is 2 thirds. But in writing it that way, I'm a step closer to being able to factor out a common factor. And that's what I really need to do is factor out that GCF. So that GCF is going to include an x to the negative 1 third. It also can include, if you wanted to write it a little bit more, 5 thirds uh, x to the negative 1 third times x minus, well, 10 is 5 times 2, so let me write 5 thirds times x to the negative 1 third times 2, like that. So just split that up because that leading part, let me underline it this way, that leading part is your greatest common factor. So, okay, let's factor out that GCF. It's going to be 5 thirds x to the negative 1 third times, this is the nice part, what's left behind? Oh, just x minus 2, right? x minus 2. This can go into the denominator, so I'm left with 5 thirds times x minus 2 
over x to the one third. And you can write that as a cube root if you want. It doesn't really matter to me. It's not going to change things. And I could also bring the three down here. But that's what you needed. You needed to simplify this derivative in a nice way so that you can look at it and say, okay, where are the roots of the numerator? Where does the numerator equal zero? Um, who's out there? Jeff? Okay, Jeff. Jeff's doing a lot of work for us today, but good job. X equal two. And the denominator equals zero simply when x equals zero. So you've got two critical points. Both of those are in the domain, so both of those are critical points for our function. Let's do our testing of points here now. So x, f, f prime. We had roots at 0 and 2. So at 2, the derivative was 0. And at 0, the derivative didn't exist. So we should see that reflected in the graph. There should be something, some feature of the graph, maybe a vertical tangent or a corner point that reflects a zero or a derivative that doesn't exist. Now, um, I'm not going to show all the gory details, but let's just fill in some, some other details. With your calculator, you can plug in actually the derivative you can plug in the derivative in this form, uh, or this form, it doesn't really matter, and test points. So when you do test those points, you'll find out you have a positive, negative, positive type pattern for our functions. So the graph is increasing, decreasing, and increasing. And let me remind you, sometimes I'll ask you for where a function is increasing and decreasing. It's increasing on negative infinity to zero union two to infinity. Please don't give me y coordinates uh, uh, regarding where the function is increasing or decreasing. Of course, it's decreasing in between here, decreasing on zero to two. What about the second derivative? Second derivative, we're going to play the same game that we did with the first derivative. So let's find that. For the second derivative, to calculate the second derivative anyways, I'm going to go all the way back up here and differentiate and then worry about this. Why am I doing that? Well, because I don't want to use the quotient rule down here. I mean, I suppose you could. It might actually work out all right. But I want to help you practice this trick right here. So we'll go back up to the top here y prime equals 5 thirds x to the 2 thirds minus 10 thirds x to the negative 1 third and let's find the second derivative y double prime is going to be 10 ninths x to the negative 1 third minus uh, that should be a plus right plus 10 ninths Negative one third minus one is negative four thirds. So yay. Okay. Again, these are a distance of one apart. So let's do this. If I wanted to write this with a negative four thirds, I'd have to add one to that. Uh, so I could do this ten ninths x to the first power times x to the negative four thirds plus ten ninths x to the negative four thirds. Why did I do that? I did that because I wanted a nice easy way 
to get a common factor. The alternative to that is to actually do the work and show the work of dividing out that greatest common factor. So if you're not really happy with this, then an alternative approach would be to say, okay, I'm going to take and divide out 10 ninths x to the negative 4 thirds. Now when I do that, each of these terms has to get divided by that term that I'm factoring out. So 10 ninths x to the negative 4 thirds. So each of these terms, I'm going to write that as 10 ninths x to the negative 1 third, and then 10 ninths x to the negative 4 thirds, like that. Hmm. Okay, well, from here, you just do the cancellation. That cancels, and that cancels. So you're left with a 1 plus. This all cancels. And if you're careful when you do this, negative one-third minus negative four-thirds, this is a double negative here. So it's like adding four-thirds to negative one-third, it leaves me with just an x. So, okay. Coming back down to here, if I factor out the ten-ninths x to negative four-thirds, I'm left with an x, which comes from here, and then nothing here, so I have to leave a placeholder here of a 1. So x plus 1. And as before, we can move that 4 thirds to the denominator. It's going to give me 10 times x plus 1 over 9 times x to the 4 thirds. And it makes it easy to see where the second derivative is 0 or undefined. And that's going to be at x equals negative 1 or 0. So let's make ourselves a little chart here. x, f, f double prime. So at negative 1 and 0. Again, this is something that you might want to put into your calculator to test points. So I'll show you this one. Let's see. Um, I'll do it this way. 10 times x plus 1 in parentheses divided by parentheses around the whole thing. 9x to the 4 thirds. Hopefully your table setup matches this. And then when you go to the graph, second table, not to the graph, but to the table, we can test some points. I want something to the left of negative 1, so we'll do negative 2, negative 0.5, and we'll do positive 2. So interestingly enough, it didn't necessarily alternate, did it? Uh, let's see, did I? mistake here someplace? Mm, no. No, it didn't. It went negative, positive, positive. So negative, positive, positive. So that's concave down, concave up, and concave up again. Wow. All right. A lot of information to put together. Don't worry. I only put like six or eight of these on exam, so shouldn't be too bad. Um, let's go back and take a look at this one and see that it matches everything that we expect. So at 0, we can see why we had a derivative which was undefined. is because there's a corner point there. At 2, we had another critical point. That critical point happens to be a local minimum. Not a bad idea to plot where the graph crosses the x-axis, crosses at 5, so that's nice as well. But boy, these other things, they'd be tough. They'd be really tough. <laughs> um, the inflection points, 
wow. It'd be tough to spot this one, you know, where the graph changes from uh, concave down to concave up. Man, you zoom in on that all day, and maybe a little bit towards the end here, but it doesn't really look concave up. But the calculus is telling us that this is concave up here. Nice. All right. Any last questions on that? Yes, Jeff. Yes, you'll absolutely be able to use your calculators on the exam. And I encourage you to graph these with your calculator alongside of what your calculus is showing you. But I do want to see some work. I want to see that your calculus matches what you put down there. Okay. A couple more here to finish things up. A couple mystery functions. And we'll start with the first mystery function here. Uh, mystery function, yes. Oh. All right, mystery function one. Hopefully you get the link to this presentation and can follow along with your own, your own work as well. Now, let's take a look at what we're given about this function, and I have to give you some stuff that isn't on your handout yet. My bad. But the stuff that's not on your handout is, um, let's see, we've got limits. As x approaches negative infinity, as it goes out this way, the graph goes down towards negative infinity, or excuse me, goes out, goes towards zero. But to the right of the y-axis, as x approaches infinity, the graph plummets down towards negative infinity eventually. And let me share with you a couple other things here about the graph. So I'm going to give you some information about the derivative. And you've got some information about the points. So the points here are already plotted. And at x equals 0, f of x is 1. Um, f prime is 0. So you should have some kind of a critical point at 1. Excuse me, at 0. At x equals negative 1, the second derivative is 0. And at negative 1, the value of the function is about 0.74. We'll call it 0.74. You get all the digits you want over here or could want. What else? To the left here, positive, negative, positive, negative. Take a moment. See if you can't figure out what this is saying to you about the function. And start trying to form a picture in your mind of what that function would look like. So, pause the video if you'd like. Hopefully you filled it in with some of this information, increasing, decreasing, and then concave up, concave down. And let's, let's not forget about these limits over here. This one, eventually this graph is going towards zero, at least to the left of the y-axis and to the right of the y-axis, it's plummeting. So, all right. Let's see if we can't match everything up. Let's see if we can't make this look good. Now, the function is increasing until we get here, but there's a little change in the function at negative 1. It goes from concave up to concave down. And it's concave down the rest of the way. So, let's do our best here to fill that in. So concave up, and then it starts going concave down. So 
concave down. We've got a maximum point here. And then it goes down, 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 like that. So there's my cheap graph. I could probably do better if I took more time. Let's do the big reveal here. So mystery function 1, got our critical points, and there's the function. So, and if you're curious, it was problem 42, and the function was 1 minus x times e to the x. We're going to play that game again with the second of our two mystery functions, and that again should be on your handout. So let's finish things up, head on out of here, and look at mystery function 2. So that'd be this one. Kind of like the last one, they give you some information that we got to take account of. And it should be on your handout. It might not be, but I'm going to give you a couple extra little bonus points. These points are just points on the graph of your function. In fact, the information about mystery function 2 is going to start out with information about its domain. So let's look at mystery function 2. Mystery function 2 is defined everywhere except between negative 1 and 1. So this graph doesn't exist between negative 1 and 1. There's nothing here. That should not be part of your graph. But we do have some interesting information. For instance, the derivative is always positive. It doesn't matter what point you choose. As long as it's a point in the domain, the derivative is always going to be positive. So this graph, somehow or another, this graph is always increasing. Well, let's see what it has to say about the second derivative. The second derivative follows these patterns. Now, one thing to kind of take note of, um, because there's this hole in the domain, this gap here, when you're testing points on either side of this critical point at square root of 6 over 2 and negative square root of 6 over 2. At these critical points, um, you're going to test points on either side, but you've also got to test points. Um, well, let, me, let me back up a second. I'm testing points on either side here, even though the main starts at uh, or ends at negative 1 and picks up again at 1. I'm testing points on either side, so I just put this line down here to help me keep track of things. So the function has got what shape here to the left of negative root 6 over 2? Good. Concave down, and then concave up. And then we're going to skip there. There's that gap in our domain, and then it's concave down to concave up again. So, all right, what on earth is going to go on there? Well, we've got enough points here to plot this, and I've embarrassed myself enough today with all my graphing, so let me just take a look at the graph here and see if it matches my expectations. So let's just click this function, and nothing's happening. So let me try it again. Wait a minute. Is that... Oh, that was the last one. My bad. Let's... Just uh, version one, function... Ah! Is this it? Yeah, there we go. Okay. So there's our graph. And, again, it's really tough to see that, gee, this is concave up. Uh, and this is concave down. Without the calculus, it would be quite the challenge. Uh, if I'm a little bit better with my graph, maybe I can kind of see the concave up shape. But, boy, over here to see the concave down shape, it's not happening too much. Again, these are things you can graph on your graphing calculator to try and help you out. But I still need and want to see some help from the calculus. Any other questions? All right. Well, let me give you some homework. Homework for section 4.5 would be 1 through 9, 13, 15, 19, 
27 through 35. Oh, let's see, do I want to throw in some more here? I don't know. What do you think? Uh, you know, I'm thinking problem 37 looks pretty good. We should probably have at least one more with some trig functions. I'm sorry I didn't get to any trig functions today, but there you go. See ya!